Okay, let's get started. Everyone's finished assignment 10, right? You made it. You made it to the end. Although it's not the end, it's the end of the beginning. So now you have all of the moving parts for a successful evolutionary robotics experiment. You have a non-trivial robot running around in a virtual environment with a non-trivial evolutionary algorithm attached to it and a relatively non-trivial fitness function, which is selecting for phototaxis. Anyone managed to successfully evolve phototaxis yet? Maybe a couple? Okay. As you probably figured out, there are many bells and whistles you need to add in to get it to work well, or you got extremely lucky with your initial random uh, controller. So uh, just as a reminder, what we're looking for in assignment 10 is not successful photo taxes, but we're looking to make sure that your robot responds to light in some way, that it's not moving identically in all four environments. And there's some evidence that evolution is making some progress towards photo taxes. Your robot is doing particularly well in one of the four environments and pretty well in a second environment and maybe fails miserably in environments three and four. That's, that's sufficient for assignment 10. Okay, any questions about assignment 10? Okay, that means you are now moving over to the final project. I already went over this a few, month, a few, week, few months, feels like a few months, right? A few weeks back. Uh, when the graduate students were starting on the final project. So I wanted to just touch on that uh, again. So uh, undergraduates, you're now working on weekly report number one. And in weekly report number one, which you'll submit next Monday by 11.59 p.m., will be a description of what you are going to present to us uh, a little over a month from now during our exam period on May 10th. So what is your final project going to be? And then within there, you're going to describe how you're going to break that project down into two weekly increments, two steps towards that project. And you'll demonstrate the implementation of your first, the implementation of your first step towards your final project the following week. And then you'll demonstrate that you've successfully implemented the second step towards your final project in weekly report number three, which you'll submit on the 24th. Uh, I had weekly report four on here. Um, I've removed that. Undergraduates, you're just submitting three of these weekly reports, and you then have between the 24th and the 10th to complete and write up your final project. Okay, so the challenge this week between now and next Monday is to think up an idea for your final project. That's not trivial. Something trivial would be adding a couple of hidden neurons to your existing quadruped. That's something that could probably be done in a few days. And something that is not overly ambitious. So you're aiming for the sweet spot between overly trivial and overly ambitious. What should that sweet spot be? Neither myself nor the teaching assistant can tell you. That's, that's up to you. The best we can do is to give you an idea for things that have been done in the past. So in the final project uh, document down here, I listed a whole bunch of project ideas. I added two at the top here, and these were the more successful final projects from last year. So they give you an idea of sort of what's possible and what's, what's expected. So let's have a look at the billiard bot here. Notice a number of differences between this and the phototaxin quadruped. Not bad, huh? Okay. How did this student make the how did this student make the oops, let's see, let's go back to the beginning here. How did the student make the billiard table? There's obviously four holes in the four corner pockets there. There's no, hole, there's no holes in pyrosim. It's just a, a ring connecting the table to the saddle. Not quite. Five objects. Can you take the difference in objects? Can't do that in pyrosim. You just lay five objects with the 
right. One's around the edge being shorter, and then four more around the edge being taller. So they want to be Getting closer. The green itself. It's is it a rectangle and then on the side there are two other rectangles? Or two rectangles lying on top yeah. of one another, right? So again, there's a lot of ways to hack PyroSim. <coughs> PyroSim is lacking a lot of things. You can't take difference between objects, you can't bevel and so on, but there's quite a bit you can do if you think about how to combine together rectangular solids and cylinders, right? There's also no spheres in, in uh, PyroSim, so how do you create spheres? Create a cylinder that the radius is the same as the height, so like a cylinder has a radius and then there's a height. The cylinder has a radius, and what's the length of, of the sphere? Zero, right? So the length of the cylinder is actually the length of the, the part without the rounded edges. So length zero will give you, will give you spheres, right? Okay, so um, between now and the end of the semester, for the first few minutes of every class, I'll give you sort of tips and tricks of, of ways to hack things in PyroSim. Um, we don't have time today. I won't go into wheels. Maybe I'll do that on, on Thursday, but clearly you can make wheels uh, in uh, PyroSim. So think about your project, and again, it's up to you to try and figure out something that's not overly trivial and overly challenging. So hitting things and knocking them into holes or knocking them into other objects, those kinds of things are a good level of uh, difficulty. Um, throwing objects is also another, another uh, possibility. Here was another successful project from last year. What's the fitness function? How close it gets the object to the target object, but something there's probably another term in that fitness function, not just distance between the thrown object <clears throat> to the target object. The robot probably can't move, so it, it can't move. I think they welded the object, the robot, to the ground, anyways. Maybe, maybe how far it throws it. To make sure that it holds on to it first, right? The vast majority of random controllers will knock the object off. So there's another, there's another good project. Okay. So things like um, hitting, throwing, um, simple object manipulation. So picking up an object and placing it carefully somewhere else is doable. It's a little more, more challenging, right? Throwing objects in a particular direction. Those kinds of very simple sensor motor coordination tasks are, are doable. Picking up the red object, placing it, picking up the green object, putting it on top of the red object, picking up a blue object and putting it on top of the green object. Again, possible, but getting quite, quite challenging. Has anybody ever done this where it's like a, this catapult one, and then like there's another one that hits? Like a pitcher and a hitter? Ah, Successfully? There's, a great, there's a great project. So here, here you've got a pitcher, but no, no hitter. That's, that sounds reasonable to me. Okay, so again, have a look through this list to get a sense for you know, what's, what's doable in the four or five weeks that we have left. Okay, what exactly are you going to be presenting um, at the end of uh, this period, in the exam period? What we're looking for, again, is a de demonstration of successful implementation. And what does successful implementation mean? Well, you saw two successful implementations there, where you can immediately see by looking at the video that this is probably not a random behavior. There was a significant, significant amount of evolution that went into it. Right? The chance that a random controller would have knocked one of the billiard balls into the other billiard balls and have both of them enter the pockets extremely, extremely unlikely, right? So the main thing that we're looking for in the final exam period is a clear explanation of what your final project was and a clear demonstration that you achieved it. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect, but clearly a demonstration that you've got something that wouldn't be found just by, by random search. Okay. The other thing to think about in the final project is, um, again, how to break your idea down into bite-sized chunks. So let's go back to the billiard bot example. What might be the first two weekly implementation tasks? If you were taking the phototactic quadruped and turning it into a billiard bot, what might you try first? Getting the objects on the Sorry? Getting the objects on the 
Exactly, right? So build the billiard simulation, right? That sounds like a reasonable goal for a week's effort. After you've got the simulation set up, what might be next? Have the robot hit a ball, right? Make a much simpler fitness function and just demonstrate that you could do some evolution with this billiard bot. And then in the remaining three weeks, work on your evolutionary algorithm, work on your fitness function so that it selects for getting both balls in the pockets. That sounds like a good breakdown of, of that task. Okay, so again, that's what you're thinking about this week. Um, ways to help your thinking is again, have a look at some of the projects. Um, in the quadruped project, remember we did this engineering drawing where you had the top view, side view, front view. Um, you might try sketching out some of these simulations. How many pieces are gonna be needed? Where do the joints go? What kind of sensors are you gonna need for your, your proposed task? You might try and mock some things up in the simulator this week. So if you're thinking about the throwing robot, you might rip the quadruped out of your simulator that you have at the moment and just try and build a robot arm. How easy is that to do? So play around with sketches and sketching in PyroSim to get a sense for, for what's doable. Yes? Uh, question about the schedule. Yes. Uh, I'm nice week tomorrow most of my dates, but the last week of class is what? Uh, when is the last week of class? Am I missing a few dates there? I think we have a couple of open slots. I haven't got that far okay. yet. I just wonder, you're not canceling classes. I am not canceling classes. We will have classes all the way up until the end of the semester. We have lots of interesting things to talk about. Um, we'll see, we'll probably move some things around there towards the end of the semester. Lots left to talk about. Okay, yes. So the first report is like the proposal. Uh, is the, the proposal. Some increments, but then like you have like kind of two weeks after that to do more, like what are you expecting by the end of the Week. By the end of the third week, by the end of the third week, there's nothing to submit. After you've submitted your third and final weekly report, you've got the rest of the time to implement your final project, which you'll be demonstrating during the exam period, however long that, that works out to be. Yeah. Okay, so again, sorry, just a few more comments about the final project here. Um, big thing we're looking for when you present your project is again, you evolved. Maybe not optimal, not an optimal behavior, but something pretty close to what you had uh, in mind. Some of you may be uh, proposing a project, uh, or sorry, let's, let's do it this way. So think about the fitness curves, which we've seen many times before. So we have generations, a number of evolutionary <clears throat> generations on the horizontal axis, and we have fitness on the vertical axis, right? So in addition to the video of the billiard bot or the throwing bot, You'll also probably want to show us what your fitness curve looks like. And what we'll be looking for in the video is, again, an evolved behavior, which is clearly different from what you would expect a random controller to produce in whatever the simulation is. And we should also be able to see that in the fitness curve in which average fitness of random controllers is significantly lower than the fitness you obtained for your final evolved controller. Make sense? Okay, some of you may be doing a, what's called an A-B comparison. So you have robot A and you want to compare it against robot B. Or you have evolutionary algorithm A and you're comparing against evolutionary algorithm B, right? Your project might be to demonstrate that the hexapod robot or an octopedal robot is better or more evolvable than the quadruped. Robot A compared to robot B. Or you might take the genetic algorithm um, that you have in your code at the moment, rip out the genetic algorithm and try and replace it with a more high-powered evolutionary algorithm and show that with the more high-powered evolutionary algorithm, you get better phototaxis on the quadruped. Comparing yeah. evolutionary algorithm A, the current genetic algorithm against evolutionary algorithm B, whatever else you want to put in there. So what does it mean to claim or try and prove to us that B is better than A? Well, you do several evolutionary runs with A, and you're going to get a sense for, let's say, 200 generations and three or four or five or 10 runs. On average, how well does fitness increase over that evolutionary time? You implement B, and you do a bunch of runs. And if you're lucky, hopefully, you'll get a set of curves if you do multiple evolutionary trials 
with B that B is better than A. So for those of you that are doing a comparative study, we're going to want to see a picture that looks like this. Right? Now, whether B actually does better than A or whether maybe uh, B does worse than A, that's OK as long as you can convince us what you compared and what the results were. Okay. Any questions about, about that? All good? Okay, sorry. One last thing I want to say about this. A couple of you have asked about once you get your once you get your simulation up and running and your evolutionary algorithm up and running, how do you collect these results? Well, my advice would be um, is do some coding during the day and then in the evening start up one evolutionary run. Let it run on your laptop overnight and in the morning uh, you'll have completed 200 generations or however many generations you set. Uh, for the night, and you've got one run down. So, um, however, whenever you get everything up and running, however, day, how, however many days you have left until May 10th, one night do a run of A, the next night do a run of B, the next night do another run of A, B, A, B, A, B, and get as many trials of A and B as you can by the time you need to present your project. Okay, I think that's all I have to say about the final project for now. Good? Okay. So back to our schedule. Where are we and where we're going? So we're still working our way through this uh, theme on open problems in the field. And the last one we're looking at here is how do we scale evolutionary robotics up, right? So we now have 65 functioning evolutionary robotics simulators. Um, how do we scale that up to hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands? We're going to have to find a way to get lots of people involved and help them collectively influence uh, populations of evolving controllers. And we're going to look at one attempt to do that, um, which, we, uh, uh, which we conducted in my group a few years back, the Twitch Plays Robotics Project. In this project, we're going to try and recruit a huge number of people to not only evolve the robots, but to set the fitness functions themselves. And if we're going to have random people out on the web do that, they may not necessarily be mathematically inclined, so we can't ask them to write down equations representing fit fitness functions. So we're going to do the next best thing, which is to get them to propose fitness functions in the form of plain English. So they're going to try and talk to the robots. Robots, you should do X. And then they're also going to score those fitness functions. They're going to give a thumbs up whenever the robot does do X whatever it is they ask the robot to do, and they're going to give a thumbs down whenever the robot fails to do what the crowd asked the robots to do. So that takes us into another aspect of intelligence, which is language. Are these robots clearly don't speak any language. They don't speak English. How are they going to understand a fitness function that's posed to them by the crowd in plain English? Okay, so last time we finished by introducing this project by starting by thinking about language. Oops, that's not what I meant to do. Okay, so remember that the, the last time we talked about language at the beginning of the semester, we had the Chinese room problem where we have uh, something or someone in the room that doesn't understand language just sees a whole bunch of signals, see, sees a whole bunch of symbols, has a lookup table and says, if you see this set of symbols, write this set of symbols and pass it back out of the box, right? So there's this sort of strange situation where with a big enough lookup table, you might have something that's able to fool people outside the box into thinking that it understands language where clearly the thing inside the room does not understand this language, which, again, d depending on how you think about the Chinese room, it calls into question what exactly do we mean by understanding language? What does it mean for a machine or even a human to understand language? How do we know when something or someone understands language? The Chinese room uh, has an old history in AI and has influenced a lot of approaches in AI, which basically are also attempts to teach machines to manipulate symbols, or in the psych project, predicates, to try and understand language. This has also um, bled into state-of-the-art machine learning methods, where uh, deep learners understand language in the sense that they can look at an image and tell you, in plain English, 
what is in that image. So we could argue about whether uh, this particular neural network understands cylinders or kittens in YouTube videos or whatever we task the machines to recognize in the images, but it still leaves this sort of unsatisfying feeling that the machine somehow is missing important aspects of the things that it sees in its world. So in neuroscience, there's growing evidence that humans understand language in a very different way, which is that they fundamentally connect language with action, right? And how do we know this? Well, as we went over last time, in the human brain, in the motor strip, which lies uh, along the medial strip of your, your brain here, is the motor homunculus. So when someone touches your toes, that part of the uh, strip lights up. When you hear the word toes, that part of your brain lights up. And when you say the word toes, that part of the brain lights up. So there is some fundamental connection between language and action. We, saw, uh, we ended last time with this slide, a recent uh, paper that uh, placed people in a functional magnetic resonance imaging uh, machine, an fMRI person just lay there quietly and heard various words. They heard three words which phonetically are very similar to one another, lick, pick, and kick. They sound similar. You would expect naively that because those words sound so similarly that the brain would light up in very similar ways, and that is absolutely not what happens. The brain may hear these as phonetically very related, but they are also very different in that they relate their motoric words. <clears throat> motoric words are words which simply light up the motor part of the brain, and they, as not surprisingly, they're usually verbs that have something to do with body parts or, or actions, right? Lick lights up the mouth part of the motor homunculus, pick lights up the finger part of the motor homunculus, and kick lights up the feet and the lower leg part of the motor homunculus. So as far as we know at the moment, we still don't know how humans learn and interpret and generate language, but unlike current methods in AI, there's a fundamental connection between language and action. Okay. So there's growing evidence for this in neuroscience. There's also evidence that comes from linguistics. This is kind of an interesting one for those of you that are interested in language. Uh, George Lakoff, very uh, world-renowned linguist, wrote a series of books uh, about this connection between language and action. And one of his most compelling examples are what he calls embodied metaphors. So imagine you are in conversation with, uh, imagine you're in conversation with someone who is a non-native English speaker and they have never heard the idiom before, don't jump to conclusions. You're in a heated argument with this person, you're both trying to make your points, and they conclude something and you point your finger at them and say, don't jump to conclusions. Most non-native English speakers will understand what that idiom means the first time they hear it without you having to explain it to them. Why? come from different cultures, you have different native tongues, you have very native backgrounds, but somehow you're able to make this connection. Is it because of the context of the conversation? Nope. Doesn't have to do with the conversation itself. Do you understand symbolically? <clears throat> you understand symbolically what jump means. It's actually, you may understand the symbol, so assuming they, under, they know jump and they know what jump means, but what does jump mean in the context of this sentence? But it, you know what it feels like to jump. You're, you're going from here very rapidly with little control, just landing somewhere. You, both of you who come from very different cultures, you have very different backgrounds, very different experiences, you may be different genders, you may have different age, come from different age groups, you both know what it feels like to jump. That is the connecting piece. Your body, not your culture, not your language, your body. The jump part of the motor homunculus lights up in the listener who hears this idiom for the first time. And because of that, they know, they, they can draw on all these intuitions about the felt experience of jumping. When I jump, I sort of, I'm missing certain things, right? I'm jumping over things on the ground and getting to a place without having to deal with everything in between. Aha, that's what this interesting idiom in English is that I've never heard before. Okay, here's another embodied metaphor. Don't look back in anger. Kind of a weird one, right? If I look back, there's no anger back there. What the heck does this idiom mean? Don't 
You take it literally, obviously it doesn't make much sense. What, is, what does this idiom mean? Don't hold a grudge. Okay, that, that's what it means. But what does this specific idiom mean? When it says look back, what, is it, what does the speaker mean by look back? I look back and I see the blackboard. Thinking of the past, right? So there's no mention of time whatsoever in this idiom. But most people, and again, if you have friends who are non-native English speakers, try this out on them, right? Most of, most of us can infer it has to do with the past. Why? How do you immediately know that looking back has to do with the past? I have a question mark. Okay. Okay. You could say that with the meaning of don't look back, like, like don't look back at me with anger in your face. It could. There, there might be a literal interpretation, but that's yeah. not usually what's meant by this idiom, right? It, do, it is not meant literally. It implies looking <clears throat> into the past. But why is looking back, looking into the past? It seems that people have a conception that we're moving forward <coughs> in time, so back is the past. If, you, if you've never thought about it before, it's kind of strange, right? In most cultures, they tend to associate forward with the future and back with the past. Why? because we walk forward, right? Again, this is an embodied metaphor because it is ultimately rooted in our embodiment, the human embodiment. We are mostly, or our ancestors were mostly a predator species. We tend to look forward, and given our particular strategy of locomotion, which is bipedal locomotion, most of the time when I'm walking around, what I'm looking at is about to be in my future, right? If I keep walking, I'm usually walking in a straight line and I will arrive where I'm looking. As I'm walking, if I look back, I see where I came from. I'm looking literally into the past, right? It's a couple of cultures that associate forward with the past and backwards with the future, but not many. Most of them have it this way. Okay, so um, let's play the embodied <coughs> metaphor game. There's two. What other idioms? Yep. I was just curious if, if they have any idea why those cultures do that. Go read George Lakoff's book, and he will explain <laughs> it to you much better than, than I can. Okay. What are the cultures offhand? I don't know the cultures offhand. Okay. We're straying outside my area of specialty. <laughs> <laughs> all right, embodied metaphors. You're all experts in embodied cognition now. Let's stick to English for the moment. What are some other embodied metaphors? There are thousands of them. I'm looking forward to your ideas. Look before you leap. That's a great one, right? So again, has to do with our perceptual system and our movement strategy. Look before you leap. That's a good one. Yep. Others? To walk on thin ice, yes, great, it's a Vermont specific one. Beating yes. around the bush. Beating around the bush, yeah, that's a good one, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, don't cast the first stone. Don't that's cast one. the first stone, that's a good one, yep. Tricky, it takes a little bit of getting used to. Use some elbow grease. Use some elbow grease, that's a good one, yeah, yeah, absolutely, sure. If you don't have elbows, it doesn't make a lot of sense. <clears throat> All right, I'm not going to take this lying down. I want to hear a few more before we go on. <laughs> I've got my eye on you. I've got my eye on you. That's a good one. Okay. Some of them are more literal and some of them are more figurative, right? Kind of interesting. <laughs> I've got your back. That's a great one. Or I love that one. Or watch your back or I've got your back. Very good ones, right? One of the problems about being a predator species where most of your perceptual systems are facing forward Unless you do this, right? You need someone to get your back. Yeah, same line, the eyes in the back of your head. Eyes in the back of your head, that's a great one. Yeah, exactly. Put your best foot forward. Put your best foot forward, yeah, absolutely. So we are an asymmetric species. You tend to, uh, most of us are righty, a few of us are lefties. Same thing goes for your feet. When you go snowboarding or surfing, you'll figure out what your best foot forward literally is. 
Hand in hand? Okay, now we're getting the, the hang of it. Yes. Hang on. There you go. Okay. Okay. Great game to play if you're interested in language and the things we've been talking about in this class. Think on it. Okay. Okay. Cliffhanger. Yep. Yeah, that, that counts. That counts. It's not. Yes. Exactly. Sometimes it might play. Okay. So assuming we there is this connection between language and action, it suggests a way forward, a different way forward for getting machines to understand language. And remember, that's what we're doing in this lecture. We want machines to be able to learn language so that we can have large numbers of people teach them fitness functions and train them on those fitness functions. So let's start with a particular symbol. And remember, um, did I mention this when we talked about the Chinese room problem, the symbol grounding problem? Did we talk about the symbol grounding problem? Maybe I didn't mention it. Okay, the symbol grounding problem is related to the Chinese room <coughs> problem because language is made up of a whole bunch of uh, symbols, and symbols for our purposes are just going to be English words, jump, then, red, green, and so on. Okay. If you try and teach a machine, like in the Chinese room problem or in the psych project, you have a whole bunch of symbols, and you can, the machine can learn relationships between those symbols, but it tends to go around and around and around between these symbols, right? This symbol means these other symbols, but it's sort of cyclical, right? It's going around and around. There's no grounding of the symbols. The machines don't really understand Bill Clinton uh, or United mm -hmm. States President uh, in the same way that we do because we ground it in experience, right? So the symbol grounding problem is the problem of how do we ground symbols in felt experience. And the, the results from neuroscience and linguistics tell us that Humans did it. They made this connection between action and language, so maybe we can get machines to do the same thing. Okay, so let's take one symbol, J-U-M-P. Let's assume we have a machine or a human who doesn't know what J-U-M-P knows. All they know is that as they move around in their environment, they can sense, so we're talking about sensory data now, they can sense pressure on the soles of their feet, and as they're moving <clears throat> around from time to time, they actually jump. And when they do, there's a sudden drop in the pressure on the soles of their feet <coughs> off the ground. And whenever they do, they hear somebody say J-U-M-P. Someone points at them and says J-U-M-P. Whenever this happens, whenever they experience this, they hear this symbol. And if they do, if they're a learning machine, they will start to associate these two things together. Right? They tend to co-occur in time. Whenever I feel this, I hear this. So J-U-M-P, if you were to ask this machine after a while what J-U-M-P means, it will do this, it will jump. It will show you that it knows what jump means by jumping, right? Or alternatively, when the machine jumps and you point at it and say, what was that? It will issue J-U-M-P, right? So the beginning of solving the symbol grounding problem is to get a machine to detect co-occurrences in time between particular felt experiences, a drop in pressure, for example, and symbols. Once it starts to learn that relationship, that sort of, it becomes the ground or the foundation for doing the same thing with increasingly abstract or less motoric words. So jump is a very motoric word. You can close your eyes and you can feel physically what it feels like to jump. Movement is somewhere in between, right? There's lots of different ways that you can act where you feel like you're moving, right? That might be walking, it might be riding a bicycle, it might be in a car, in a plane. Those are, it's, a, it's a broader category. So there's a less and less perfect correspondence between any one felt experience and that word. It's less motoric. So it's hard to ground it or to find a relationship between movement and felt experiences. There's a bit of a connection, but you can sort of recursively ground it in more, more motoric words, right? It, movement may, may co-occur with <coughs> JUMP and lots of pressure on the soles of your feet. Movement may also co-occur with um, WALK and a feeling of gentle oscillation in the legs, right? You may find a relationship between both. So gradually a machine or a young human child might start to learn that M-O-V-E-M-E-N-T 
co-occurs or is related to these other things, J-U-M-P, W-A-L-K, R-U-N, right? So imagine now a machine that is able to recursively ground increasingly abstract words all the way up to something like socialism, which doesn't really light up any part of the motor strip, but there is at root some chain all the way back down to felt experiences. So here we have increasingly abstract words as we go up, but you could imagine jump at one level, don't jump at the next level, and don't jump to conclusions at the next level up. Right? Okay, so this is just a hypothesis for what may be happening in uh, humans. And what you're going to see in the Twitch Plays Robotics Project is we're going to try and implement this. We're going to implement machines which do exactly this. Okay. Okay. So how does this work? I'm going to walk you through the Twitch Plays Robotics Project, and you're going to watch evolving robots that ground, gradually ground English symbols, English words, in felt experience. And they're going to do it in four stages. So I'm going to walk you through the experimental procedure here. Step one, the machines are going to act. So in PyroSim, they're going to move around at random. And as they're moving around at random, they're going to be listening for humans. They're going to be listening for symbols. So they're going to observe people. People are going to observe the machines and are going to pose fitness functions and are going to score fitness functions. And now in stage three, the machines are going to learn, or in our case, they're going to evolve to find relationships between English symbols and their actions. And the fourth and final step is the machines are going to predict. So they're going to hear from the crowd a particular symbol, J-U-M-P. The machines are going to generate an action in response to that symbol. And the machines are going to predict how the crowd is going to react. So if the machine hears J-U-M-P and stays rooted on the ground, that's fine as long as the machine can predict that everyone's going to say thumbs down. That the machine knows or predicts that its current action is not obeying that symbol. Alternatively, a machine might hear J-U-M-P and jump off the ground and predict that whoever is out there on the web seeing that action will give it a thumbs up. So that fourth and final stage is our way to tell whether the machines have actually started to learn language. And by learning language or understanding language, we can be very specific here. A machine understands language if it can hear some language, generate an action, and before it performs that action, or before the crowd responds, it knows how the crowd is going to respond to its action. Make sense? OK, let's go through this in a little more detail now. Let's start with action. So we have our simulation here. That's PyroSim. It's going to generate a whole bunch of random neural network controllers. We're going to simulate them on a, on a machine here on campus. And we're going to live stream this to Twitch. Everybody familiar with Twitch? Most people? OK. Huge website where everyone goes to watch other people play video games. And you can chat in a chat window next to the person playing a video game and comment on them playing the video game. We have a Twitch channel called Twitch Plays Robotics, where we live stream our PyroSim simulator to Twitch, and then people in chat can talk to the robots. As they talk to, uh, as they talk to the robots, we have a chat bot which is going to scrape the Twitch channel and pull back all the chat and put it into a database. So in the database, we're going to have a growing number of controllers and chat, and because we have a timestamp associated with each controller in each chat, we know which <coughs> robot or which controller the crowd was, was talking to. Okay. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention this was work actually done in the Unity physics engine. It's a different physics engine from uh, Pyrosim. Okay. The cycle goes around and around and around. It runs 24-7. If you go to Twitch this evening and check out Twitch Plays Robotics, it's still running and you can go talk to the robots there. Okay, so that's action. What does this actually look like? I'm going to play the video for you here. So out of curiosity, how do you control or do you control for trolls? How do you control for trolls? That is a good question. I'm going to play this video, and you may see a few trolls showing up in the chat window here. I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Okay. 
Okay, so here we go. Uh, we have our simple worm robot here. You'll see in a moment there's also a legged robot. So there are two different robots. We switch back and forth with them hour by hour. Hour one is the worm, hour two is the quadruped, hour three is the worm, quadruped, and so on. The instructions uh, that we have on the Twitch channel is for the user, uh, uh, observers of Twitch Plays Robotics to think of these machines as pets. You can teach them commands. Um, they can probably learn a few simple commands. There's lots of complex commands that they probably can't learn. And the game, if you like, is for the crowd to collectively figure out what these machines can actually learn. So you'll see in the top right window here, I'll just pause this for a moment. In the top right window here, people are proposing uh, commands that they want to issue the machine. So there's, imagine a bunch of people standing around a dog and they're trying to decide what should we teach the dog next. So they're collectively voting on what to teach uh, the robot next. Remember that each one of these alphanumeric strings is a candidate fitness function. Okay. At this point in time, uh, five people have voted for walk forward, one for spin, and a couple people that are bored of the worm robot and the quadruped robot and they want something else. So here's our, our troll showing up. Okay. When this uh, counter counts down, um, it's at 168 seconds, so 168 seconds from now, the command that received the most uh, votes will be issued to the robot. So far so good? Okay. At the moment, the robot hears the current command, W-A-L-K space F-O-R-W-A-R-D. How does the robot hear? How does the robot hear? We take this string and just assign a random unique number to it, and that becomes fitness function 17. So if this is the 17th unique command that's ever been issued to the robots. We assign the number 17, and that integer is, is added uh, as input to the neural network controller of the robot. So the neural network has, as usual, touch sensors and proprioceptive sensors. It also now has an ear where it doesn't actually hear the alphanumeric string, it just hears 17, right? So this was our first attempt at this. Pretty simple, here's the idea, okay. Is the purple robot currently walking forward? I hear one no, pretty much all no's. So let's see what happens here. If we look in the lower right, we see it, uh, what was that? One, two votes, no, three votes, no, zero votes, yes, four votes, no, one vote, yes, maybe because it crossed the red line there. The crowd was almost unanimous that no, right? So we have a fitness function. That fitness function is 17. And we have one controller, the purple controller, if you like, that was just evaluated under that fitness function. And it got three no's, and one, or four or five no's, and one yeses. So uh, every, time, every time we hear a no, we subtract one from the fitness value for that controller. Every time we hear a yes, we add one to the fitness value for that controller. So that value. That fitness controller got minus five, plus one. So the fitness of the purple controller under fitness function 17 was minus four. Make sense? Question. Uh, what would you vote if one guy would say, yes, run forward? Because some, you know, something might say, oh, that was walking. So if it ran forward, yeah. how would you vote? Yes or no? Is that is that walking forward? Um, the one you said. Let's imagine a quadruped actually runs forward. Running, it'd be, it'd be a good job, but it, well, My guess is you'd probably get a few yeses, a few noes, depending on who's on the site at that time. It's probably not going to be unanimous yes. You'd probably get more yeses than noes because it crosses the red line here. Who knows? It's more comparison. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> if you were on the side, it would be three, three thumbs up, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That would be nice. That would be nice. Okay. Okay, so back to the trolls question here. Uh, we made it clear to the user base that they could <coughs> issue any commands they wanted. And most of the time, one of the, most of the time, they issued simple motoric words. Walk, walk forward, spin, left, right, back stay still, stop, don't move. 
Very simple motoric words. We never told the crowd to do that. We just said, issue any commands you want to the robots. So part of the inspiration for this project was to try and uh, exploit people's natural instinct to teach, right? Um, we naturally, we instinctually teach animals, we teach young children, we to some degree are born with the ability to teach. And part of our ability to teach is to observe the learner and to estimate what is the capability of the current learner. Can it learn, walk, move forward, run? Right? Run was not issued very often because if you watch this simulation long enough, running is very rare and the crowd figured that out. We didn't tell them that. Right? So the crowd collectively calibrates the challenge of commands that are issued to the robots based on what they see. That was one of our hypotheses, is whether the crowd would do that. And generally speaking, uh, they did, not all the time. Some of the other commands that were issued were um, prove for Matt's last theorem. <laughs> the us didn't do so good at that. Um, someone else said, be yourself. Uh, it was kind of an interesting one. So, is this robot being itself? Yeah. Yes. yes, maybe it actually got you know some yeses uh, and nos. Um, you people would say things like move forward three meters, then stop, then turn, and go two meters to the left. Motor, yeah, motoric, yes, but com too complex didn't didn't work out, right? Um, another group when we first launched this uh, figured out the system and they started writing in chat, hey, it looks like these scientists are trying to run this experiment. Um, come back at 11 p.m. and we're going to teach some very specific words once the scientists have gone to bed, right? <laughs> the scientists were watching this channel, so you can bet we were there at 11 p.m. Um, a bunch of users went off to a subreddit and set up a subreddit and started a comment stream, and they picked four very bad words. And they said, let's assume that these four, these four very bad words, the first one means forward, second one means back, <clears throat> left, and right. Then they went back to the stream, they issued these bad words, and whenever that bad word was issued to the robot, the robot heard that bad word, that group would collectively select yes if it turned left and no if it did not turn left. So this group was doing exactly what we would have hoped they would do, which is collaboratively come up with some words and consistently reinforce or assign fitness to those words through coordinated uh, action, and they cho chose the words we would have hoped they wouldn't have, have chose, right? But this is the internet. What can you do about it? Um, Joey Netzberger was the primary author on this work. She took this course a few years ago, and this was a big extension of her final project. Um, we eventually wrote this up and had it published, and we wrestled with whether to include the four bad words in the paper, and they're in there with asterisks. And if you go ask Joey, she'll tell you what those bad words were. Uh, could you not have gone into the robot and changed whatever commands it had gotten and then changed those bad words and just leave three and left? We could have censored things, uh -huh. right? Um, which we thought we might have to do. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing, part two of this story, is the bad guys and girls were eventually outvoted by the good guys and girls. Another group said, wait a second, there's this bad group that's coming at 11 p.m. <laughs> So, hey, everybody, come here at 11 p.m., and every time you see one of the bad people give a down vote, give an up vote. And whenever one of the bad people gives an up vote, give a down vote. And they literally outvoted the bad people. So the robots heard those commands, and in the first night, they started to get consistent reinforcement, meaning they were starting to learn that this bad word means left. But eventually, that was washed out by the good people so that the robots still heard those words but no longer understood what they meant. Sort of like you hear those words and mommy and daddy are having an argument. <laughs> they, they, yeah, those words have lots of connotations, exactly. Same thing for the, for the robots. Yes? Do you know the max and average viewer count on the screen? I will show you that in a, in a moment. We'll look at the statistics in a moment. So is there any long-term learning where they like, like learning every time how to recognize this kind of language. Okay, also a good question. We haven't talked about how the robots learn or evolve given this feedback yet. We're just looking at phase one here. Oops. 
We're looking at phase one here, which is just action, right? The robots have a whole bunch of these random controllers. They're hearing through this additional sensor neuron. They're hearing numbers, which are associated with the commands. And they're getting back a whole bunch of fitness functions and reinforcements. So let's move on to now to observe. How do, the how do the robots handle all of this incoming data from the crowd? So um, Joey tried to represent this with uh, a tree here. So remember I mentioned there are two robots, the worm robot and the quadrupedal robot. So if robots ground language in action, if robots have different bodies, do they, do they find different relationships between language and action, right? Walk may mean something very differently to the quadruped than it does to the worm. So that's why we had these two different uh, robots with two different bodies, R0 and R1. For each one of these robots, the crowd issued a large number of commands. So CIJ, the I subscript is going to reference the robot, so I can equal 0 or 1. So C0 would indicate a command that's issued to the worm bot. C1 will indicate a command that was issued to the quadruped. When J equals zero, that means that was the first command ever issued to that robot. So C00 represents the, com the first command that was issued to the worm robot. C10 represents the first command that was issued to the quadrupedal robot. So far, so good. And remember, the commands are just integers, right? We take these unit. We are looking for unique alphanumeric strings, and they become one of these Cs. Okay. For each one of the commands, um, and if you go back and watch the video, the co a command is issued to the robot for three minutes. During those three minutes, six controllers are evaluated under that command, and each controller controls the robot for 30 seconds. So each command, every time it's issued, collects six uh, controllers. If the command is issued again, either five minutes later or the next day or the next week, then more controllers are evaluated under that command. So we have, over time, a growing number of commands, every unique alphanumeric string issued to the robots by the crowd. And for each command, we have a large number of these n. So now n i j k. So a k equals zero is the first controller that was evaluated on the robot under the jf command on the if robot. So far, so good? OK. Last but not least, for each controller, we have two numbers associated with it, S0 and S1. S0 is the number of down votes that this controller got under the JF command. And S1 is the number of positive reinforcements that controller got under that command. Right? And remember, all the crowd has to do is say, why? Why is positive reinforcement no, an N or no is negative reinforcement. So far, so good? Okay, so as this runs, as you can imagine, we start to collect hundreds of commands, thousands of controllers, and lots and lots of reinforcement. So I'm going to show you a second video now to give you a feel for how this works in practice. So here's a greatly sped up video of Twitch Plays Robotics. So you can see as this goes, we have large numbers of controllers. People vote for different commands. And if you look carefully at the right there, you'll see people issuing new commands and issuing positive and negative reinforcement. So as this runs over time, we start to develop this very large database of different commands issued to different robots, different controllers evaluated under different commands. And each one of those controllers collects zero or more yeses, and zero or more noes. Okay. So I haven't had said anything about evolution yet, just action and the crowd response. Okay. So um, in this paper, which we wrote up uh, two years ago, um, over, I think we ran this for a couple of weeks. I don't think it says here. Yeah, over a couple of weeks, we had thousands of people watch the stream, but we had 424 people uh, type something into chat. Um, we sent 
57,000 uh, controllers. So everywhere that you see evaluations, that just means a controller. Okay. We sent 57,000, but around 6,000, only a little more than 6,000 of those received one or more, uh, one or more reinforcements, right? So a lot of the controllers that were generated late at night, there was no one on the stream and no one said anything. Or there were people on the stream, they couldn't decide whether this was a yes or no, and they didn't uh, reinforce the robots at all. This was a surprise to us. We had almost 9,000 commands issued to the robot, right? So just one command, J-U-M-P, was issued multiple times, but there were all sorts of things that were uh, issued. And here's the top five. So jump was issued 385 times. So that's 385 three-minute periods during which jump was issued to the robots. Yes? Is that 9,000 different commands? 9,000 different commands, exactly. It's amazing. So does that count like when, you, when we as humans see that's the same thing but if you spell it incorrectly or if you yep, like, absolutely. You, like, start walking forward? Yep. So J-U-M-P and J-U space M-P would be considered different commands. J-U-M-P with the space at the end is also a unique command. So we didn't do anything to try and find semantic equivalency, right? We just left that up to the robots and the people. So a lot of those 9,000s are misspellings, jump with an exclamation point on the end, jump with two exclamation points on the end, all, all sorts of things. I think there's a reference in the paper to the full list of all commands, including <coughs> bad words. You can see them in there, uh, and off you go. Okay. We got 7,500 yeses and nos combined, so actually less than the total number of commands, which is kind of ish interesting. Oh, I'm sorry. Joey did go back and look at those 9,000, and after the experiment, she filtered that down to 266 unique commands. My apologies. Okay. Um, okay, mean reinforcement signals per evaluation. What this means is, on average, each controller got slightly more than one Yes or no. A lot of them got none. Some of them got one yes, one no. A few of them got two yeses or one yes and one no. On average, a little more than, than one. Each of the 424 people on average issued about 18 uh, uh, reinforcement signals. And proportion of positive reinforcement, um, I'll talk about O in a moment. O ranges between zero, which indicates unanimous negative votes. So if a controller gets one no, or three no's, or 18 no's, that's an O of zero, unanimous negative reinforcement. An O of one is one yes, two yeses, 17 yeses, unanimous positive reinforcement. So what does an average of 0.28 tell you? That a lot of the controllers did badly. A lot of the controllers did badly, or? Well, people said they did badly. That's the difference. According to people, most of the time they were giving thumbs down. Were they giving thumbs down because they were trolling? Did they give thumbs down because they actually thought the robot was not doing what it was supposed to be doing? We don't know. Okay, so that's action and observation. So now armed with this data set, we're gonna try and get the robots now to learn this relationship between action and language, right? There's no learning, no evolution yet. So what Joey did was to filter this data set and she picked out um, the most popular command, jump. So we're gonna throw away all the other 265 unique commands. We're just gonna filter out all the controllers that were executed under jump. And we are then also, whatever those controllers are, we're gonna throw away any controllers that received zero yeses and nos. So it's hard to see in this picture here, but we're looking for controllers that were evaluated under jump, which received at least one reinforcement signal, at least one yes or no. Joey took all of those controllers that remained in that set, and she reran them in the simulator, and now she recorded sensor data from those machines. And she recorded just touch information. You can see it a little bit better here. So the touch information was stored in a matrix, uppercase T. So for each controller, each controller generates a matrix T, where each column in T represents one of the robot's objects. Or one, or sorry, represents one of the robot's touch sensors. 
and each row represents one time step in the simulator. So, for example, this element here, which is in the second row in the third column, indicates that the third touch sensor um, fired if that <coughs> element equals one, or didn't fire if that element equals minus one at the second time step, second row. Okay, so now we have sensor data. We have the command, J-U-M-P, and we have the crowd reinforcement. So now we're going to try and learn a relationship between T and O, which again, as I mentioned, ranges between, I'm sorry, O ranges between minus one and plus one. You can read the math here, but basically we're going to take all of the commands, and at O equals minus one means unanimous negative reinforcement, and O of plus one means unanimous positive reinforcement. So far so good? Okay. Here's what that data looks like for the worm robot. So here are all the controllers issued to the worm robot under JUMP that received at least one reinforcement. Each dot here represents one controller. What can you tell me based on this visualization of the data? What does the horizontal position of each dot represent? So it represents the proportion of time that the robot is grounded. So in essence, what that means is we look at all the rows of uppercase T, and if it, in that row, if there is at least one one, that means at least one touch sensor was firing, at least one part of the robot was on the ground, so it was grounded for that time step. Right? And we just calculate the fraction of those rows in which the robot was grounded. So what does this point out here tell us about the action generated by that controller? What was the robot doing? Who was off the ground. Right? Who was off the ground, right? The robot felt that most of the time it was off the ground, right? So what is that, about 47% of the time, 47% of the time there was at least what one touch sensor firing and 53% of the time none of the touch sensors were firing. This point out here, the robot spent almost every single time step on the ground, right? So that's the horizontal position of the point. <coughs> the vertical position of the point is O, right? How the crowd reacted. So what do you know about this particular point? How did the crowd react to that point? Unanimous negative reinforcement, right? Points up there, uh, unanimous uh, positive reinforcement. The ones here at zero, remember that we filtered controllers for those that received at least one reinforcement. So how could you get an O of zero if we filtered for? One person up and one down. Exactly, or two up and two down, whatever it is, right? Split, split vote, right? The crowd was not sure about those, those actions. Okay, so that's the data that we have for the worm uh, robot. The, yes? Is there any of those ones on, on the bottom or the very top where you have unanimous or yep. just one vote? Uh, the vast majority of them were just one, right? Remember, uh, right, where is right. it, this one here. Most of the time, most of these controllers got one vote. A few of them got two, even less got three, and so on. Okay, so the, the dotted line is our linear regression model. So this is the learning part, so no evolution yet. We just took this dotted line and we tried to fit it so that this dotted line would be as close to all the dots as possible. It's not a very good fit, as you can see. Most of the points are a fair distance away from the straight line, but it's enough uh, to see that there is clearly a negative slope to this line. So you remember your, your uh, high school math, y equals mx plus b. So we're learning m and we're learning b here, and m is a negative number. There's a negative slope. What does that negative slope mean to the robot? You can do better when you have a linear model. Exactly, right? So if you were to ask the worm bot what jump means, it will give you back the dotted line. That's what it means. It means m equals minus whatever that slope is. There is a negative relationship between social response 
and felt experience as it relates to my touch sensors. So we can claim that the worm robot understands jump in the sense that it has found this relationship between action and language. Okay, so that's a good question, right? So remember that these robots are controlled by a neural network. The neural network has an input layer of sensor neurons. Some of those are touch, some of them are proprioceptive. And the other one is a single sensor neuron that receives an integer, and that integer is unique for every command. So if this robot receives JUMP and it does something, then we take the exact same controller, we set it to the center of the simulator and input a different command, WALK. What's the robot going to do now? What can we be sure of? Is it going to do exactly the same thing? No. The sensor value, it hears something different, right. right? It's going to try something different. Now, what that different action is, I have no idea. Uh, yep. Sorry, yep, that's okay. Yeah, that's and again, this is results from large numbers of people, right? Many people probably issued JUMP, and many people gave yes and no. And across this entire data set, the only thing this robot knows is the less time I spend on the ground, the more to the left my controller ends up, the more positive reinforcement I'm going to get. It doesn't try anything. There's no evolution yet. These are just random controllers. We, ha we haven't even got to any evo evolution. That's okay. Just we're, uh, just random controllers, thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Yep. So it, it seems to me that one people are pretty bad at scoring things. But um, sort of one question Maybe. I had off of that was that why is you're sort of giving it a fitness function in essence that's purely based on time spent off the ground? Is there give the data for the average height that it was? Good question, right? So I know that could just be like little hops that people thought it was a jump. When you think about it, right, what does jump really mean? A lot of these seemingly simple motoric words, when you get down to the nitty gritty, it's not as easy as it, as it seems. So we cheated a little bit by putting in, taking, not taking the raw sensor data, not taking the raw touch, but transforming raw touch in a way that we thought would be easier for the linear regression model to find a relationship here, right? So um, I don't know if I'll get to it today. I'm going to show you the last part of this experiment where we just give the machines raw sensor data and see if they can do it. This was sort of our sanity check to see is the crowd behaving itself, right? Are they giving, <laughs> is there enough signal in the signals we're getting back from the crowd to find this relationship? Is there a relationship at all, right? It's not very clean, but it is definitely this. <coughs> So that's, that's a good question. We'll come back to that in a moment. That's the worm robot. Here's the uh, legged robot. Same command, J-U-M-P. These are all the controllers that were uh, executed on the legged machine under the same command. We got about the same amount of data. And again, we did regression against this data set and again found a negative slope. We again found that it's not a great fit but it is a firm fit, so we can be statistically confident that the slope actually is negative. So these two different robots both understand jump, and they understand it in the same way. They both know that there is a negative relationship between the amount of time you spend on the ground and positive reinforcement from the crowd. But if you look carefully at the vertical axes, <clears throat> of these, and I apologize, they should be equalized. But if I go back and forth from these, you'll notice that the M and the B in these two different models are different. Both M's are negative, but the actual value, and I don't remember what it is, is different. So in some ways, these two machines understand jump in the same way, but they also understand it in a slightly different way, which confirms our second hypothesis here, which is machines that have different bodies ground the symbols of language in different ways. 
They understand the same English word slightly differently. Right? This might seem like kind of an esoteric exercise. Why would we care about that? Why did we bother looking at that particular question? Why does this matter for robotics? Well, because like half of robotics is building the robot itself, and then you're tying that to the neural network code. So if you're, you know, if you're looking to get a robot to do something, you might you might be interested to know that you know the brain's in that body can do robot only you know two million things. Exactly. So different robots can do things in different ways, and if they if two different robots ground language in different ways then presumably a robot and a human ground human language in different ways, or they may, right? And that's problematic because it raises the specter of perverse instantiation again, right? A robot might say, I understand JUM perfectly, but unbeknownst to us, it understands it perfectly in its way, which is very different from how humans understand jump, or move, or move safely or transport a passenger in this autonomous car safely, right? Grounding jump and move is maybe not such a big deal, but dealing with adverbs, move safely, move carefully, move slowly. Most humans, when they hear that, they know what that means instinctually. How can we guarantee that a machine understands slowly, safely, carefully in the same way that a human does? So that's gonna take us from a transition about language to robot ethics, and I mentioned we're gonna to touch on robot ethics in this class. We'll do that um, on Thursday when we finish this uh, lecture. Uh, you have a quiz due tonight. Start thinking about your final projects, and I'll see you on Thursday.